everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about chapters one and two. So you can just follow along on the screen if you want. Um, it's the same text that you guys have on the blog. <clears throat> and I will be using some of the tools that you can use as well when you're reading. Um, the highlighting and the underlining and all that. So, okay. Um, chapter one opens up with Frankenstein introducing himself to us, but obviously he's talking to Robert Walton. So you have to remember that Frankenstein is actually on Robert Walton's boat, still recovering from his illness. And um, the whole purpose of this conversation is for Frankenstein to tell Robert Walton of what he has been through and what has brought him to this point of ending up in the North Pole. And he has, um, in the last letter, Walton tells us that the whole purpose of Frankenstein opening up to him is because he wants his story to serve as a warning to Robert Walton not to make the same mistakes he has made as a result of his pride. So we talked about in class that Robert Walton, although he has good intentions to um, discover a direct route through the North Pole to the other side of the world, um, his intentions are seeded in his pride, in wanting his name to go down um, in history as being credited with the first explorer to do that. So um, apparently whatever story Victor has to tell has something to do with his excessive pride and ambition um, that got the best of him. And now he is suffering the consequences. So this all brings us back to um, the whole scenario of the mariner and that poem that we talked about in class where he sits this guy down at a wedding who he sees is kind of not serious about life and just all about partying and wants him to hear his story so that maybe this guy will think a little bit more about life and not let his arrogance get to him one day and make mistakes that might bring his downfall. So um, it's probably one of the reasons that Mary Shelley decided to allude to that particular poem because it all kind of ties in with the structure of this book as well. The story within a story. Um, so chapter one, um, one thing I want you to note is that Victor's description of himself very much mirrors, um, the description that Robert Walton has given of himself. <clears throat> Both of them come from wealthy families, very educated. Um, Victor talks about that all right in here. And, um, they are both men who have kind of gone sort of against the traditional expectations of their fathers to um, study their passion for things that don't go along with what young men of that time were studying. So um, what I want you to see as the book starts to unfold is that Victor and Robert Walton are supposed to be um, kind of the same type of character. So they both, if you line them up as characters against each other throughout the book, you will see that they have very similar qualities. Um, so when you talk, when you learned in the doppelganger lesson about characters being like reflections of each other and um, kind of one and the same, Mary Shelley most likely intends for Victor and for Robert Walton to be kind of a doppelganger of the other. They're both on the same um, path to find out some kind of knowledge about the world that may bring their destruction. And they both come from very similar beginnings and family backgrounds. So um, that's one thing that she's wanting you to see as you're reading about Victor in chapter one. Um, so Victor goes on a pretty lengthy description, of course, um, if you read the chapter about where, um, how his mom and dad met and how his beloved who he calls his sister Elizabeth came into his life. So what I need you to understand about the relationship with Victor and Elizabeth is um, they, she was adopted into the family and you need to read the chapter of course to see the background on how that happened. But his mother and father, their sole purpose in bringing her into the family was to arrange for she and Victor to eventually get married. So um, it seems a little weird that she is referred to as his sister and sometimes he refers to her as 
um, that they're cousins, there is no blood relation between them. And it's just kind of the simplest way for him to refer to her to other people that don't understand the relationship. But they grow up together and they grow up um, growing to love each other, despite the fact that they grew up in the same household. And so, um, you know, he does foreshadow at the end of the chapter that they are meant to be together. So um, he says right here in this part of the chapter, and um, I apologize because this version doesn't show page numbers, but um, when his mother brings her home after adopting her, she says, I have a pretty present for my victor. Tomorrow he shall have it. And when on the morrow she presented Elizabeth to me as her promised gift, I with childish seriousness interpreted her words literally and looked upon Elizabeth as mine, mine to protect, love, and cherish. Um, all praises bestowed on her I received as made to a possession of my own. We called each other familiarly by the name of cousin. And then he goes on to explain, but there's no way you could, uh, um, he could express their real relationship and love for each other. So kind of get past that whole icky factor. It's not really incest, although I know um, you guys like to think of it that way, but um, it, you know, they are not blood related. She was adopted in the family when she was like five years old, but it, it is a little strange um, by our modern standards. So he does in the chapter with saying, we called each other familiar, familiarly by the name of cousin, no word or expression could body forth the kind of relation in which she stood to me. My more than sister, since till death, she was to be mine only. So he is foreshadowing that that is the um, sole you know, goal is for one day them to marry. So that's been put out there. It's no secret and it's not supposed to be icky. Okay. Um, so their relationship throughout the book is going to be very important. Okay. So really that's the gist of chapter one. Um, one thing I do want you guys to take note of as you are reading each chapter are some words that continually come up over and over again. Mary Shelley uses certain words over and over, and these become very important to the themes throughout the book. Um, one of the words that she uses quite a bit um, that Robert Walton uses in the letters as well, if you were to go back and look, is the word ardent or any form of ardent, like arduous, ardor. And the word ardent really just means extreme passion, okay? Having ardor for something. And I'm kind of scrolling through to see if I can find an example while I'm talking to you. But um, remember that romantics, that's what they're all about, is extreme heightened emotion. And their characters are often over the top with their emotions. And they're over the top passionate or obsessive about certain things that they care about. So Robert Walton says in the letters how ardent he is about four times throughout those letters in finding that passage to the North Pole and in achieving glory. And Victor is going to do the same thing throughout the book. He's gonna talk about his ardent passion for finding the secrets to life, for figuring out how to um, keep anyone from having the sadness of experiencing death. So as the book progresses, I want you to look for um, and notice that, that word that comes up over and over again. Um, the other word that comes up quite a bit that you will notice now that I've told you is the word creature. Um, when Robert Walton first met Victor on the boat, he said he was the most um, you know, intriguing creature I had ever met. And then when he talks about the first time that he ever laid eyes on Elizabeth, she was the most beautiful creature he had ever met or seen. And um, he talks about people that he cares about that um, impress him um, in using that word. So obviously the word creature has a meaning to it that means otherworldly. It means inhuman almost. And in that way, he's using it to describe people that are so impressive to him that he Things are so different and so special that they're otherworldly in their specialness, okay? So um, remember that. That's important to note how he uses that word creature to describe certain people throughout the um, novel. So, um, and again, as I'm talking, I'm scrolling through to see if I can see um, those words, but you know, you can now be more in tune to it as you read. 
Okay, so in um, chapter two, um, we now progress on, um, and he, he talks about how he and Elizabeth were brought up together, how, um, you know, as the years went by, they became closer and closer. He develops this admiration for her. Um, he says right here, Elizabeth was of a calmer, more concentrated disposition, meaning than him. But with all my ardor, I was capable of more intense application and was more deeply smitten for the thirst of knowledge. She busied herself with following the aerial creations of the poets. Um, and then, you know, how she's like very appreciative of nature and how she um, just kind of appreciates life. And he says he is more obsessed with delighting in investigating the like secrets of nature. The world to me was a secret which I desired to divine. Curiosity, earnest research to learn the hidden laws of nature um, were unfolded to me among the early sensations I can remember. So basically what Victor is doing is telling Robert Walton from the beginnings of when I was really little, I began this obsession with learning about the secrets of nature, the secrets of what creates life scientific secrets that was his passion growing up kind of like walton's passion he tells his sister is has always been about exploration so you can see how that foil um i'm sorry that doppelganger relationship between victor and walton is beginning to show up it's like victor is hinting as walton is he's telling walton the story he's hinting to him look you are a lot like i am i can see it in your eyes you may end up going down the same path that i went down so keep that in mind as he's continuing to tell this story to Robert Walton. Um, so Victor goes on to um, you know, tell some more things about his life. He, inter he introduces us to Henry, um, who is his best friend. So again, kind of like Robert Walton, where Victor has very few people in his life that he can uh, that match him in his intellect, that understand and get him. So um, Elizabeth and Henry, who he calls Clarival by his last name, are the two people in his life that kind of, you know, take that sort of role. Um, they are direct contrasts to Victor. They're a foil, a character foil to Victor. And you may have talked about character foils when you read Romeo and Juliet, how like Benvolio and Romeo were complete opposites and Benvolio and Mercutio were complete opposites and so forth. Well, that's how Victor and Henry and Elizabeth are. Whereas Victor has certain qualities and Clerval and um, Elizabeth have certain qualities that are you know, similar. If you were to put them together and line them up next to each other and you line up all of these similar categories in all of the characters, they would be direct opposite reflections of each other. So that's what a foil is, is characters that are pitted against each other in direct opposites by the narrator. I mean, I'm sorry, by the author. So, um, so Elizabeth's character and Victor's um, character are supposed to be like complements of each other, but complete opposites. Same thing with Henry. They complement each other because they have a lot of similar like categories, um, their desire to learn, their love of life, their respect for nature, um, that kind of thing. But they're so opposite in their way of approaching the world. And you're gonna see how that becomes very important throughout the book. Um, when you line Victor up against all the people in his life that are his foils or that um, are important to him, he always stands out as being the one that has the flaws, the one that has all the, the issues, the temptations, the curiosities and all that that bring him down. Everyone else in his life has self-control and kind of serves as that voice of reason to him, particularly Henry and Elizabeth kind of like Benvolio did to Romeo. So Victor goes on to tell us in chapter two how he has this perfect life, uh, didn't want for anything. Parents were wealthy, very educated, loving, doting, um, best friends in the world. He could not have had a more perfect life. And one of the reasons he's trying to tell Robert Walton all this is to let him know I had it all and there was no reason for me to be so curious and to want for more, but I just couldn't help myself. And here I am now suffering the consequences of that.